get all these notes straight and I've gathered up so much stuff. I feel like I'm going to some sort of classroom setting really to teach. But it's been interesting, has been for a long time. We're studying about the origin of civil government. We did our best last week to emphasize that government did not originate with man. The very fact that God is a God of order and the very essence of His being flowing out and seen in His nature, whatever God does is ordered. And there's not going to be any kind of law or order except there's a law. Interesting, years ago we used to talk about law and order. Nowadays we don't talk about much of either one, it seems like. But the truth of the matter is uh, a law is a rule of action. Uh, generally speaking, that's just what a law is. And uh, order has to do with action. Therefore, you've got to be laws governed, and they come from somewhere, not in men just of themselves alone, not thinking about God, but just matter in motion, come up with the idea of government. I want to read to you what John Locke had to say when he wrote in his, what he wrote in his treatise on civil government. The state of nature has a law to govern it, which obliges everyone, and reason, which is that law, teaches all mankind, who will but consult it, that being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in, the, in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. Then he goes ahead to say, in transgressing the law of nature, the offender declares himself to live by another rule that of, that of reason and common equity, which is that measure God has set to the actions of men. A criminal who, having renounced reason, the common rule and measure God hath given to mankind, hath, by the unjust violence and slaughter he hath committed on one, declared war against all mankind. Now remember, we're made in the image of God. That is, there is stamped upon our spirit, our real man, that will continue on and never cease to be the imprint of deity. How far that goes, how much that is involved, I frankly don't know how to say it, but I know enough of it, such as the moral nature of man, that we have the ability to say, this ought to be this way or this ought not be. And uh, we have also then the rational powers to reason and come to a conclusion or we would be told to prove all things, hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Now I quoted this from Locke because Locke was one who influenced a lot of the founding fathers of this, of this country along with others. But the point I wanted to make here was that most of those fellows, not just them, but I'm talking about people like Locke, not just the founding fathers, but people like Locke, philosophers and others. Not all of them. I want to hasten to say not all of them. There are people like Voltaire who uh, certainly didn't hold the same views as Locke did. But I wanted to read those because they did have influence on the thinking of people. Now remember, our founding fathers were not New Testament Christians. Let's keep that in mind. Some of them would not be even what we would call denominational Christians. Most of them were tied up in some way with the prevalent denominations of that day. And denominations have changed so much over the last 230, 40 years that you can't really compare a lot today with back then. But the point is, is that there was within every one of them an acknowledgement of that which did not begin or end with man. Thus, where did it come from? And Locke's trying to tell us. And you may not agree with everything he says, but he's trying to say law and order is anchored in the very being of God. And people can know it. And I'll say what I did last week. The primitive pagan peoples all try to go about to have some sort of law and order. But then things begin to change to a great extent. And a lot of us think it's only changed the last 50 years. Well... It hasn't. It, it started changing in the philosophers' minds even in the 19th century. But uh, I want to read what Woodrow Wilson said in his book, The New Freedom. Woodrow Wilson was elected president in what, 1912, 
I believe, 12, 13. Well, I believe he took office 13. And he went through uh, World War I and uh, on past that. Uh, but here's what's interesting, the, the difference in philosophy. Now, he, he was a highly educated man, formally speaking. He was the president of a college, and he was governor of New Jersey, and he went on in then to the White House. So he was of the scholastic academia type person. Um, and here's what he had to say concerning government. Quote, government falls not under the theory of the universe, but under the theory of organic life. It is accountable to Darwin, not to Newton. It is modified by its environment, necessitated by its tasks, shaped to its functions by the sheer pressure of life. Living political constitutions must be Darwinian in structure and in practice. Society is a living organism and must obey the laws of life, not of mechanics. It must develop. All that progressive ask or desire is permission. In an era when, quote, development, unquote, quote, evolution, unquote, is the scientific word to interpret the Constitution according to the Darwinian principle. Folks, that was uh, 100 years ago. Now, there were a great many people in the colleges and universities that felt that way, and they were determined to change this country. And it, uh, the changes you've seen since 1960s started in the 19th century. And we don't have time to go into all that. But you see, a, a, and this is the reason I quoted him, you see a tremendous difference from him, uh, in him from those who uh, believe that civil government, law and order, derive from God, and all things derive from God, so it reflects God. And that man develops these things because it's in him to do so, no matter how pagan it is. A fellow by the name of Nathaniel Micklem, who was a former principal of Mansfield College in Oxford, England, wrote a book, The Theology of Politics, and on page 60, he says, the source of our being and the artificer of our nature is God himself. That doesn't sound like President Wilson. That, quote, law of nature, unquote, which, as the apostle, he means Paul, in Romans chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, held, is written on the hearts, even of the heathen, is an expression of, of the reason which of itself is a reflection of the wisdom and, quote, eternal law, and quote, of God. First, then, comes the eternal law, in quote, of God. Second, as reflecting it, quote, the law of nature, and quote. And third, the customary and statute law of men, which has no validity except as an approximation of the law of nature. Again, that's, that's saying what we said earlier. That is, he is pointing out everything flows from God. And if you do a study on God himself, as I've said many times after you finish, you'll realize how much you didn't know. But in the process of learning you didn't know it, you'll learn a lot you didn't know. <laughs> that uh, you, you will see that there's the essence that is the one eternal God. Describe to me more about that essence. I can't without beginning or ending and we understand it by the attributes in each person inhabit eternity without beginning or ending uh, omniscient omnipotent omnipresent etc I can say those things and I can say he doesn't have a beginning or an ending and that he always was but I can't fathom it I guess it's it's not a perfect parallel by any means but uh, I, can, I can turn the light switch on and the way it's made, I have confidence in, and faith in the maker of it, that will utilize electricity that's been wired into the house and the lights will come on or whatever else I'm turning on that runs on electricity. But I guarantee you, they don't understand what there is 
about the very essence of electricity. But we use it, don't we? We do a whole lot with it. And so it is to a certain extent in our comparison. We understand the essence of God. Whatever He is, is not created. He's, it's just that way. Everything flows from it. If it's knowable, it's already there in God. Whatever power there is flows from God. So if there's law and order, if there is a government that enacts laws, whatever the government might be, then it had to come originally as you trace it back all the way to God. I'll, I'll pick on John here just for a moment. John can say, stop in the name of the law, and he has a right, and he has the authority to do so. And let's suppose that... Um, I'll make myself a law-abiding. Let's suppose that he stops J.D. and writes him a ticket. We won't say for what, but you broke the law. And he's the law enforcement officer, so he enforces the law. Now, if you wanted to, and if he knew you really meant it, and for sake of what we're trying to say, you could say, where is your authority to write this ticket? And he could actually say, God. It's sort of like the dimes in the envelope, the envelopes in this and it's in that and it's finally in the car. So where's the dime? It's in the car. Well, you don't have to go through all the steps back to God when you thought it through and studied it to know that His authority or any other law enforcement person. Authority comes from God. Now, where do I get that? You remember us reading Romans 13? There is no power but of God. Does John in his position as a law enforcement officer, does he have authority and power? Yes, but there's no power but of God. So where do you get it? It's delegated. Jesus said, all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. But I read in my Bible that Paul said to preachers, preach with all authority. And he tells the elders that they have authority. Where'd they get it? Thought Jesus had all of it. All is inclusive, isn't it? Anything left out. Well, where did they get it? He who has been given by the Father all authority also delegates. And delegated to the preacher the authority to preach the whole counsel of God. And delegate to elders, according to the New Testament teaching, what their qualifications are and what their work is. All right. You come down to a home. There's another God-ordained institution. There's civil government. There's the home. And, of course, the church. There are no other God-ordained institutions on this earth. Those three. So in the home, has God ruled who has certain authority? Well, he says concerning the wife, that she runs the house. But yet it says man's the head of the house. Well, it's obvious then that the man in heading up the house must permit her the area God told her she had authority over and it fits under his authority. Where did all that come from? God. Because all authority inheres in God originally. And in the first person of the Godhead. And the very essence of deity has it all, each person of the Godhead having, if you want to call it this, certain roles to play. So therefore it wasn't the Father's role to come to earth like Christ did. It wasn't the Holy Spirit's role to come to earth like Christ did. It wasn't Christ's role to do what the Holy Spirit did in revealing the truth and confirming it. It wasn't the Father's role to come to earth. In that one divine essence, the one deity, there are three persons who possess it, and only three persons who possess it, so they have always been and always will be. And when Moses at the burning bush said, Who shall I say sent me? And he says, I am that I am. There's never a time he's going to say otherwise. And there's never a state of being or place of being outside of time that he's going to say any more than I am. And when uh, the Jews talked with Jesus, got into it with Him, and said, uh, 
you're not yet 30 years old, and so and so and so and so about the temple and whatever else. And he said, concerning Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, concerning them, he said, before Abraham was. How did he say it? I am. Now we either admit to that and know therefore in our study of the origin of civil government that it comes from there or else we're going to have to say it just evolved like everything else. The evolutionist says out of chance whatever, man is nothing but um, matter in motion having come into existence through all the way evolutionists try to figure out how it did and there's no God and everything just happens. But there is no proof in any science anywhere that nothing got busy and created something. Something just does not come from nothing. And everything must have not just a cause, but an adequate cause. Remember what we said about if you find a, a terrapin or a turtle whichever, <laughs> up on a fence post, you know, God gave you a brain to think with. And knowing what the fence post is and knowing what a terrapin is and knowing how the terrapin gets around then you're going to do some deductive reasoning. And you're going to know that he's up there by a certain cause. And it's going to have to be an adequate cause to put him up there. That's how that you can increase your knowledge when something is implied. It increases knowledge through implication. Thus, if a person must repent of their sins in order to become a Christian... And though explicitly in just so many words it is not said that Paul repented of his sins in becoming a Christian, but it does say Paul became a Christian. Therefore I know, I've expanded my knowledge. I know what? I know Paul repented. Though it does not in so many words say Paul repented. And that's how we begin to go prove all things old fast, that which is good, and that's how we prove the existence of God. And if God is what He is and everything flows from Him, then all government flows from Him. Now, here's a point I want to make. Because all government flows from Him, all law and order, all idea of civil government, and you need to keep in mind why it's called civil government. We'll have more to say about that later. It's not any government. It's civil government. So keep that in mind. We must understand that that doesn't mean that every government to be acceptable to God or that we must obey it is going to be exactly like God wants it to be. There's one simple way I know that. I know when the Holy Spirit, who is God, had Paul write what he did in Romans 13, I know what government they were under. Same thing's true of Peter. You see, civil government, though it be pagan, though it not be what it ought to be, since it did not come into existence by the fertile imagination of man, but came into existence because of God and His imprint upon man, then those governments reflect God. They reflect order. Now, God in His infinite wisdom, and we by common sense and experience, the study of the Bible, uh, history, we know the majority of people never will obey God. The majority of all people who ever lived will not obey God. Most will be lost. God knew only a few, comparatively speaking, will love the truth and live it and remain faithful till death until the Lord comes again. So how is this world a function? How can there be law and order? How can there be without a government? If I were living in 1938 in communist Russia, a horrible time to live in Russia. And there was a good time to live in Russia when it was uh, USSR. But especially that time. Because uh, Comrade Stalin was killing people right and left at that time. <laughs> right and left by the millions. He killed more than Hitler killed. Most people don't recognize that, but he did. But let's say I'm living there and I get my car stolen. I'm still going to call the police and report it. Because you see, even under something like that, they still had ordinary thieves. And they had murderers. And they had to have rules and laws governing all those things. I don't care what they think about communism. Same thing be true of Nazi Germany. In other words, life had to go on. There still had to be protection of life. Same thing if you go back to the Old Testament. In the Babylonian 
kingdom or before that the Assyrians. Life had to go on for those people. That is, there had to be laws concerning commerce. There had to be laws concerning all those things. There had to be law and order. Now, where did it come from? Well, why did the Assyrians develop any kind of law? Where did the idea of law come from? It had to come from what we've already said. And you can go all the way back. So when you read about God being the source of all law and therefore all civil government, it doesn't mean that He set up a certain government in a certain way. And that before you have to obey government, that government must be the way God set it up. I don't know of a government God set up. And you can't use the Jewish government because it all figured in in the unfolding of the scheme of redemption and Jews being what they were and bringing Christ into the world and what the Jews were expected to do in keeping God's name alive on earth and so forth and so on. It won't work that way because we don't have a, um, that kind of setup anymore. That's all been fulfilled. And when Christ came, they didn't believe on Him, and He did what He did, and He went back to heaven. Then God said, don't have any more use for you. You wouldn't believe in Him, so what does He do to Judaism? He's gone. He made sure of that. In AD 70, He destroyed it. Destroyed the temple, destroyed all of that. Christ nailed the law to the cross, or it was nailed to the cross. Therefore, it's on effect, and because of the way the law of Moses functioned, they couldn't worship anymore because nobody knew what tribe uh, was the tribe of Levi. You know what tribe anybody was a member of. Well, you can't have priests, that tribe of Levi. You can't have chief priests, that uh, tribe of Levi, and the descendants of Aaron because they all came from his house. So God made it impossible for that to be anymore. That law and that uh, theocracy never was meant to be a model for everything. But law must be. That's the reason that under a law or a civil government such as the Roman Empire, as crude as it was, and you've got to think about who the emperor was too at that time when Paul wrote that. Been a sweet, dear fellow like Nero. That's exactly who Paul wrote Romans 13 under. And he was some character, to say the least. Uh, or I don't know how you describe him. So the concept of law is even seen among people who rebel against God, for they have law and order. Very interesting that when you come down to the times of the Medes and Persians, Persian Empire, and this, this got, uh, is seen in the Bible, Daniel getting thrown in the lines then, that uh, they had a rule that when the king made a law, he couldn't break it. He couldn't set it aside. And the king was, I think, rather dumb to let these other folks around him manipulate him to where he made a law, and it was all aimed at Daniel. Of course, God intervened in those days, and he delivered Daniel. But the point is, in the development of political thought and so forth, that was one of the first times that, that you had law being held above man. That man answered the law, even to the point where the king answered the law. But they were pagan peoples. They cared not for God. And so it was even with uh, Babylon. Okay, Isaiah the prophet clear, clearly reveals, at least I think he does, that all government, and I mean human civil government, and I mean even pagan government, originates from and exists by the sovereign authority of Almighty God. How can you have what Paul said in Romans 13 written under the government he wrote it under, and not conclude that. Because the Roman Empire was certainly a ruthless place, and the emperors in particular. And yet they are real big on law. Very interesting to go back and study Roman law, from which, by the way, came or over the years English common law, and much of the United States is governed or is anchored in English common law. And I think it's interesting to remember that all those folks who were agreed upon the or agreed upon the Declaration of Independence and were involved in writing the Constitution, do you realize that when they started, all they were warning were their rights as Englishmen. 
They had no intent. They had no desire to break off and form a new nation in rebellion against the king. Well, you say, well, why did they do it? Because they determined that they wouldn't be treated equally as Englishmen like the folks back over in England. And in order to get those rights, they'd have to do it their way. Now, that's just an explanation of how things changed from them seeking their rights as Englishmen and petitioning their governments and why they ended up going ahead and becoming independent. The king of Assyria had his throne only by permission. Permission of who? God. His governing powers were used by God for divine purposes, or a pagan king. And I may point out, as Ken's touched on some of these in, uh, in Wednesday night, I don't know how you can study the Minor Prophets and not study about these governments. And uh, God deposed him when he got ready to do it too. And if you go read Isaiah chapter 10, 5 through 34, and chapter 37, 33 through 38, you'll see how inspiration is telling Isaiah about all those things. Uh, Isaiah lived and did his work some 750 years before Jesus walked this earth. And over 100 years before Judah went into Babylonian captivity. And what he's really saying to the Jews is, you're suffering because you deserve it and God's taking you to the woodshed. And you're going to learn from the punishment and uh, as to what you ought to be. And as Ken has well pointed out, once they came back from Babylonian captivity, they were troubled by many sins but never by idolatry. That, that 70 year captivity <laughs> burned it out of them. Somebody said here a while back about the South and the Confederacy and that that had never been settled legally as to whether it was right legally for a state to uh, secede from the Union. I said, that's right. You know how it was settled? It was shot out of us. That's exactly how it was settled. They stumped a mud hole in the South. And they said, okay, what you want, you're not going. And more people died by disease and killing and that than there was in World War II. So that strictly hasn't been settled in the courts. It's been settled, as one fellow said, at the point of a bayonet. And that settled a lot of things, you know it, down through the years. It settled a whole lot of things. It may not be like we want it, but that happened. And that happened in these old nations back there long years ago. As the, as the world was developing... And you had like Assyria and then Babylon and the Medes and Persians. And on down until finally the Greeks. All that was predicted, remember, in Daniel. And then you have the Romans. Well, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That's what he did, Daniel 2.44. So you must, in the Old Testament, take into consideration not only these pagan nations and why they as pagans, unbelievers in God, would set up, as we said last week and earlier in the beginning here, uh, civil government, but it also figured into God's eternal wisdom the unfolding of the scheme of redemption and getting down to, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. Now in that sense, those nations arose and fell in a way that since that time, since Christ came and did His work and went back to heaven, do not compare. What we do is we try to understand the principles having to do with government now that the scheme of redemption is fulfilled in, in, when it comes to bringing Christ into the world and the nations that were involved in the way He dealt with the Jews and their involvement in it. We try to, to realize that there are certain principles that continue on even though there's not any more uh, intervention by prophets and, uh, and somebody else to come. The writer of Hebrews makes it very clear at the end of this age, all men are going to be brought into judgment. There won't be any more world and therefore no more civil government. All men will be brought into judgment, whether great or small, kings, princes, presidents, dictators, and everybody else. 
And this is the thing that you have to keep in mind as you write and divide the Bible is to understand that part has been fulfilled when it comes to God working through kings and so forth to bring Christ into the world and to deal with Israel so as to keep them a viable bunch of people, even though it were remnants all that came back to Babylon in captivity, until Christ could come. If you look at Isaiah 13, Isaiah 13, uh, verse 1, all the way to chapter 14, verse 32, Isaiah said the same thing about the king of Babylon that he said about Assyria. Now, what is that doing for the people of that day and time? It's telling the faithful remnant under the law, God's still going to perform just exactly what He said to Abraham. For thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Still going to do it. These things will not hinder me from fulfilling that promise. It reminds me of Christ saying, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. What? The promise to build his church. Well, they're going to kill Christ. How in the world is he going to build his church since he hadn't built it before his death? And they killed him. Well, men just don't stop and think that God will raise him from the dead and he'll go ahead and do it. And it's sort of like Christ said to the Sadducees when they had this man Remember, they didn't believe the resurrection. They didn't believe in the spirits. Remember, they had the man marrying, and he dies, and the law said his brother marries the wife, and he goes on down the line, and they thought they had Christ. Whose wife shall she be in the resurrection? Very simply, he just said, what? Anybody remember? Sir? Yeah, there'll be no giving or taking a, mar a marriage in heaven. You'll be as the angels. That's the first thing. But he said, you don't know the power of God and you're ignorant of the Scriptures. Well, when it comes to the way God does things through a lot of things, we can only go on the basis of what's revealed as it fits in the situation it's revealed about. But Deuteronomy 29, 29 still says the secret things belong to God. Are there any secret things? Well, I know one of them. I don't know when he's coming back, but he says he's coming back. You here want to tell me when Christ is coming back? Is he coming tonight? Is he coming ten years from now? Tomorrow? Nobody knows. It's foolishness to try to speculate on it. Isaiah is even more specific about the government of Persia. That would be necessary because... The, it's while Persia is governing things under Cyrus in particular that the remnant would be let go and go back to Jerusalem and they would rebuild what we have in Ezra and Nehemiah, the wall, and rebuild the city. Um, what's interesting, he did all of that through all of these pagan nations. How did he do that? Well, that's not the first time. What about Pharaoh in Egypt when he formed Israel? Here's somebody who says, I don't know who God is. Who is your God that I should obey Him? I think we can safely say He found out. But it would have been a lot simpler on Him and easier on everybody if He had said, well, I'm glad to know that I'll cooperate with you and help you carry out what God said do. And that's what He should have done. But He didn't. But did it stop God from doing what He said He was going to do? No. Now let me ask you something. Do you learn something from that about the eternal kingdom of which you are a citizen regarding what this world can do? Can't stop. Can't thwart God. Uh, we may have to suffer for the cause of Christ. Take up your cross and follow me, Jesus said. But he's not, he's not going to allow us to be destroyed. It is the eternal kingdom. F.W. Maddox wrote his book on church history, which we've had for a long, long time. And he entitled it, guess what? The Eternal Kingdom. I can't say the eternal United States. I can't say the eternal Great Britain. I can't say the eternal India. But I can say the eternal kingdom of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah wrote very pointedly that God plucks up and breaks down nations and kingdoms and also builds them up and plants them. Jeremiah 18 verses 5 through 11. And the Lord spoke to Jeremiah plainly about the origin of civil government. With that in mind, the origin of civil government, go back over and 
Read Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 27, 5, here's what we have. Jeremiah 27, 5. It is I who by my great power and my outstretched arm have made the earth. With men, with the men and animals that are on the earth, and listen to it. And I give it to whomsoever it seems right to me. Anybody going to thwart that? You say, well, how does he allow a Hitler or Mao Zedong or some of those characters? How does he allow Nero over the Roman Empire? Well, he knows the end from the beginning and all things in between. And he doesn't overrule those people and make them become evil. He takes them as they are and he uses them. And therefore he'll say like he did to Pharaoh, I have raised you up. Why? To show my glory, really. But that didn't mean Pharaoh didn't choose to be what he was. He just had the power down through the stream of time to say, I see that's when he's going to do it and to manipulate and work, I don't want to say otherwise, all things to make all that happen. What did happen? And so what happens with Pharaoh? God demonstrates He is the one true and living God, and what He says is so. So when we see all of these various governments that aren't like this government in the United States, it doesn't mean God has backed off, left it alone. Because if there's order and things being done decently in order, and there are in every one of them, it doesn't mean they're what God wants. He didn't want what was happening in the Roman Empire. He didn't want what was happening in Assyria and Nebuchadnezzar. Or, or, or under Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and so on. But he used it. And by the very fact there was order in civil government, and he ordained the idea, idea, the concept of civil government. He didn't ordain a certain kind of government. I wish we'd understand that. He did not uh, ordain a certain kind of government. Oh, you say, again, I'll repeat myself here. He ordained to Israel, yes, but for what purpose? Uh, that was uh, to fulfill and bring about the coming of the Christ. That was a special situation. Um, in the uh, same passage, Jeremiah 27, verses 1 through 11, the Lord calls Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, he's a pagan emperor, I guess we'd say. My servant. I see his servant. He uses him for what he wants to use him for. And he declares that the Babylonian king received his governing position and his government by God's sovereign providence. That's the reason it bothers me greatly that we are not thankful enough the fact that down through the ages and 2,000 years removed from the time of Christ that our Lord providentially has given us what we have. We're losing it. Uh, you go through the Western democracies. Uh, England is a democracy. It's a parliamentary form of government. We don't have their form of government, save it is a democracy of sorts. We have a republic if we go by anything that's said in the Constitution. And I don't know that many Americans know the difference in democracy and a republic. I doubt it. But it's the idea of government, of things in a nation being done decently in order because God's a God of order and it doesn't have to be just what He would have it to be for us before we will obey it. And if we violate it, as Paul said in Romans 13, we sin against God because it is a reflection on God since He ordained civil government. Even when it's not a government that He approves of. So Paul would say, if I've done anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. Now I want you to notice something that we don't have time to go into this afternoon. But I want you to remember the three Hebrew children what happened to them? Won't you remember Daniel and what happened to him? But have you ever noticed how with great respect they answered the king? There was no display of throwing rocks at him or screaming at him. There was no loss of soberness and propriety. But it's with great respect that they disobeyed. Because they are not going to reflect upon God's order of things because in doing so, that's to what? Reflect upon God. Now, this is something some people don't realize. When the people rebelled against Moses, now there's a form of government set up for reasons I've already said, but when the people like Dathan and Abiram and that crowd all rebelled against Moses, you know who they were actually rebelling against? 
Who set Moses in his place and gave him his authority? God did. Now listen, brethren. My brethren in the church better learn this. When elders are qualified in doing the work of elders, who gave them their authority? Who put them? Who put elders in the church? Well, they say, we, we installed elders. I hear people say, we installed elders. If you did it right, you did it on the basis of their qualifications. If they don't have those qualifications or they cease to meet them, they ought not be considered elders. But if they meet the elders and they're doing work of elders because they've been installed as elders, who made the eldership? Who did? God did. Now, if you rebel against it, what have you done? Well, he gets up and puts his britches on every morning just like I do, one leg at a time. You see, elders primarily work in the area of what is expedient, which means they know the authority of the Bible, and if this is obligatory upon the congregation, they determine the best way to carry it out, the most advantageous way. Thus, options come into play. And what we're being taught in these Old Testament lessons that were written aforetime for our learning through people, about people like Moses, could there have been other ways some things could have been done uh, that Moses chose to do it this way? Yeah, that's right. It could have been. Could there be other el could elders in one place decide this and elders in another place decide that no matter which option is best for that congregation, them knowing the congregation, knowing what they've got there to work with and so forth? Yeah, it could change. It does change from congregation to congregation. It's the idea of autonomy. All under the headship of the Christ. But when you rebel against elders, when they're doing their work that God said them to do, then don't expect well done, good and faithful servant on the day of judgment. Just don't. Any more than if you're a preacher who's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and his purity and living the truth and you decide not to obey it because his buddy will laugh at this. It's not what he says, it's the way he says it. Which means, I don't like what he said, and I don't want to do it, and I don't want to hear it anymore. That always reminds me of Brother G.K. Wallace when a fellow came up complaining because I've heard you preach on this subject so many times, and I'm tired of hearing it. Brother Wallace said, you may be tired of it, but you're not through hearing about it. And when it's the truth of God Almighty, the only thing that can save our souls on whatever topic it is, we better not, be, we better not have the attitude, I'm tired of hearing it. But I don't think we understand that. And thus, when you disobeyed like Paul said in Romans 13, when you disobeyed the Roman Empire as corrupt as it was, and Nero being the, the emperor, then you suffer the consequences, but you also were sinning against God. And that we must take into consideration. In other words, there's a lot of thought. Our form of government allows for us to speak and to point things out. But we better be cautious. You realize you can slander a governor and you can slander a senator and you can slander a president just like you can be slandered. Your wife can be slandered and your children can be slandered. And the Bible makes it clear slander has no part in a Christian's life. So again, we must be very cautious. And I say again when you look at Daniel, just look at how they appeared before them. Look at, look at Peter and John. Had we not straightly charged you to preach no longer in this name? You can hear the respectfulness even almost as you read the words. Whether it's what we ought to do or ought not do, you be the judge. We can't help but speak the things we've seen and heard. It reminds me again of Brother Rice years ago when it was Salon. And he said, the guy told him, you can't bring Bibles in here. It's against the law. Civil laws ruled against it. You can't bring Bibles in here. And Brother Rice says, I know I can't bring Bibles in here. I know it's the law is what he said. He said, I know it's the law. He said, you sure you understand? Yeah, I know it's the law. But he brought Bibles in anyway. But he didn't cause big stir. Pick up a brick and hit the guy in the head and uh, cause a stink. Run down, burning down buildings and screaming and yelling. He just went ahead and did what he's supposed to do when laws went against God it says the word of God can't be preached so a lot of times it's not just uh, the fact that we disobey men when their laws tell us we can't do what God said 
or flies in the face of God. It's how we go about it. If you go back and look at the people, and I'll have to start stopping here, but if you go back and look at the people that have been called the church fathers and lived in the first couple of hundred years after, they were making many defenses many defenses uh, of Christianity to the emperor. They actually wrote letters to the emperor. Thus, they're called apologists. And they were very respectful. Have you ever noticed how Paul begins to speak to Felix? The Festus. Most noble Festus. That man wasn't... He, he was speaking in respect of the office he held. I guarantee you the man personally wasn't that way. That's what Paul said. And the Holy Spirit had Luke record it and tells us, but you think that Festus or Felix or anybody else, Agrippa, Herod, was going to stop him from preaching the truth? No. So the Bible goes so far as to represent God as the one who stirs up the spirits of heathen rulers to fulfill divine purposes. Right down Second Chronicles 36, 22 and 23. Ezra 1, verse 1. Jeremiah 51, verse 11. Revelation 17, 17. God, that's what we mean by providence. God can work to do those things. I still say, and I'll close on this, that nobody expected the USSR to fall as it did. Nobody. They couldn't figure it. I know why it fell. Sure as I stand here, it fell for the same reason Nebuchadnezzar fell. God doesn't need the United States going to war with Russia to defeat them in a battle. Now, he has done that with Japan and with Russia, or rather with Germany. Brethren, let's close with this idea. Our God, He is alive. You know, we do sing that. But our God is in control even over pagan nations who are building civil governments, not because it originated with man, but because there's imprinted upon their very spirits to have law and order, and even though they be very far from how God would have some things done, they still represent God on earth in the order and the government as it is. We'll continue with this, Lord willing, next week. If you're not a child of God, we beg of you to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. To repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him as the Son of God, and obey Him completely in being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, if you've sinned, we urge you to be of a penitent mind. Turn from those sins mentally. Confess them and pray God for forgiveness. And we invite you to take advantage of this time to do so while we stand and sing.